Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Kaufman from Pollinator Partnership, and I'd like to welcome and thank you all for joining us for the second of five workshops in the Pollinator and Habitat Technical Training Workshop Series. We would like to invite all of you to actively participate in today's workshop by submitting questions for each of the presenters through the Q&A function, which can be found either on the bottom or right-hand corner of your screen. Questions can be answered both during and after each of the presentations. And with that, I'm excited to introduce our first speaker, Don Slack. Don has worked as a biologist for over 30 years with a focus on rare, threatened, and endangered species surveys, wildlife management, stream mitigation, and land management. She is the Director of Stewardship at the Nature Conservancy Indiana State Chapter and is the Chair of the Invasive Plant Advisory Committee to the Invasive Species Council. She is also the Project Coordinator for the statewide project, Indiana Invasives Initiative. Please welcome Don Slack. Hi everyone. My name is Dawn Slack. I work for the Nature Conservancy at the Indiana Chapter and I am the Director of Stewardship. Um, I also am the project coordinator for the statewide project called the Indiana Invasives Initiative, which is run by SICM. Um, and I am going to talk to you today about understanding the multiple and cascading impacts of invasive species and why we should go native. So I thank you so much for joining me and a special thanks for Elizabeth for inviting me to speak to you today. I appreciate your time. And I do hope that at the end of this, we will understand without a shadow of a doubt that we should be using natives and certainly avoiding those invasives. So let's dive in. And I hope to talk to you all after this presentation at the live portion. So let's start off with a definition just so that we're all on the same page and that is what is an invasive species anyway? Well, number one, it's non-native. It was brought here by humans. It's growing outside of its, outside of its native range on its own. And number two, it causes harm to the environment, human health, and the economy. And that picture is a picture that I took um, a number of years ago when I was working on my graduate studies. And that is hundreds of acres that are covered by kudzu. Um, and that particular picture is in Tennessee. But don't be mistaken, we have kudzu here in Indiana. In fact, we have kudzu all the way up along the, the lake shore. In 2012, USGS announced that the annual environmental, medical, and economic costs of invasive species are greater than the cost of all other natural disasters combined. Also in 2012, Indiana did a survey, and 116 landowners in Indiana spent more than $5 million in one year on invasive plant management. There's a lot more than 116 landowners working on invasive species. Invasive species are the second leading threat to endangered species. They're the second leading threat to our forest. They cost about $138 billion annually to manage. And about $7 billion in forest products are lost annually in the U.S. due to invasive species. 25% of Indiana's flora is considered non-native and 42% of endangered species are at risk due to invasive species. So they're very costly and they certainly cause harm. And they, ag they impact every aspect of our lives, every aspect from our national security to carbon sequestration, loss of ecosystems, alteration of fire regimes, alteration of hydrology, microclimates. They can cause erosion. They can change soil chemistry. They can spread diseases, cause human health issues, and they create monocultures. And we're gonna dive into that today because it's all of those things are detrimental, but you can definitely see monocultures without a doubt across the landscape. And those decrease nectar species that bloom throughout the year. They decrease so much living landscape for our wildlife. 
At the top of, in the right corner, that's a kudzu infection here in Indiana. That's about eight acres. And those are trees that are completely covered with kudzu. In the middle is a calorie pear infestation of uh, a mitigated wetland area where they planted 1,500 native trees. Calorie pear was not taken care of in nearby areas and is just about to displace and overcome all the work that they've done there in that mitigated area. And the bottom is a picture of invasive Japanese wisteria that is invading about three acres there um, in here in Indiana. And that is very common to see in Indiana. Um, I see it in a lot of counties, especially uh, west and south of Indianapolis. So non-natives definitely have a negative impact on our lives as well as wildlife. And it's not just invasives that have this impact, but non-natives do as well. Invasives are non-native, but if we just look at non-natives, so those plants that, that come over and they don't necessarily cause harm as I outlined here in this slide, but we have to remember that non-natives, if we plant them and we plant them all over, instead of planting natives, non-natives are not part of the system and therefore they may not be part of the food web. And if they're not part of the food web, then are they also causing harm? It's certainly something for us to think about. So what is a native species? Well, that's one that originated in the place where it was found, not introduced by humans. And native species have complex relationships with other organisms in a given ecological community. There's a beautiful example of the large picture that's on the left there. That is of a fin that we have recently found. It is surrounded by two highly invasive species that are encroaching upon it, and that's reed canary grass and uh, uh, common reed phragmites. So we're going to do everything that we can to make sure that this fin continues to survive, and hopefully we can even expand it. But if you notice, the plethora of species, there are hundreds that are right there in that fin. It is rich with life. The other picture is that of a native species that's only native to the southern part of the state, and that's purple passion flower. If we were to take purple passion flower and plant it in other areas throughout the state, um, maybe north of Indianapolis or so on, if it were to take off and grow and to start taking over areas, then that plant would be considered an invasive species. So it may be native to North America, but it's being, we moved it outside of its native range. And if it were to become aggressive and to start taking over, then we would consider that to be an invasive species at that point. So do natives really matter? Many species play a keystone role. And all have a role, whether we know it or not. So let's take a look at one species that was brought over here, it was brought into Florida, and it's called uh, the paper bark tree. And the paper bark tree, after its introduction, um, was an added species to the list of plants in Florida. So on one hand, people would say, well, Dawn, you just added another species there. What's the big deal? That's increasing diversity. But unfortunately, paper bark tree being a non-native tree, and not having any natural enemies or here, began to displace the native grasses. It replaced all of the sunny grassland with drier shaded forests that were dominated by itself. And therefore grassland birds now have no place to nest in Melaleuca groves. They find fewer insects because native insects cannot eat Melaleuca leaves. Alligators cannot make a wallow or find food in Melaleuca groves, butterflies cannot find their host. Egrets can't hunt fish because their native grassland habitat is gone, and hummingbirds cannot find the native nectar to survive from day to day. The ecological interactions that drive the Everglade ecosystem have collapsed where paperbark tree has invaded because paperbark tree created a monoculture and displaced the other organisms. And that is an overall sharp decline, a cascading decline in the species that should be there. Native species are more favorable for supporting local wildlife, including insects, bees, 
butterflies, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, we can go on and on. They feed the creatures at the bottom of the food web. They provide food and meals for many others afterwards. And all of this means that in many parts of the world, we know more about individual species and overall diversity, but we know very little about how those species interact with one another. And a lot of times we tend to think, ah, we'll just focus on a generalist because that will be the plant. Just plant a generalist and we'll, it'll, support more, it'll support more wildlife than maybe that specialist will. But that even in itself is a loss of diversity. It's important that all species, including humans, it's important to understand that we're all embedded in a complex network of interaction. And if something happens to one, it can have a cascading impact on the others, just like with the example of the paper bark tree. Native plants equal insects. 37% of wildlife on the planet are herbivorous insects that eat plants. E.O. Wilson said, a land without insects is a land without most forms of life. And 93% of North American bats eat insect. And in fact, all of the bats here in Indiana eat insects. 96% of the birds eat insects and 60% of those rely completely on insects. Even a cardinal feeds its babies insects and eats insects part of the year. Amphibians eat insects. We could go on and on. We need insects to feed the rest of the world, and we've got to have native plants to feed those insects. It was proposed after a 27-year study that was completed in Germany that 73% of the flying insects have declined there. Now think about that, 73% decline in flying insects in Germany. He concluded that the same thing is likely happening here in Indiana or in North America, sorry. That's important. We've got to have insects to feed the rest of the world primarily. And if we have a sharp decline in insects, we've got a problem. It's also important to recognize that artificial feeders, and that includes using non-native plants, plants that do not provide food for insects, artificial landscape, if you would. Artificial feeders aren't enough. Yes, birds will come to your feeder. Even a chickadee will come to your feeder, but that chickadee is not feeding the future seed. Chickadees feed their babies caterpillars and spiders. And it takes 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars just to feed one clutch, one nest, hopefully four little baby birds. Some studies say it takes about 15,000 caterpillars to feed that nest. And most of the birds feed their babies insects. The majority of them do. It takes a lot of caterpillars to get a future of birds. And how are we going to have that if we don't use the food that those insects need. Insects need native plants. And here's just an example of one of our, uh, some of our native plants, heath asters and other asters in the Symphiotrichum families or genus. These plants are native. A lot of people think they're weedy. In fact, some of them are still actually blooming in my garden. They're almost done though. But most of them consider them just to be weeds. And weeds are just a plant that are growing where we don't want that plant to grow. Whether it's native or invasive, we consider them weeds. However, these native plants, just like these heath asters and other asters within this genus, are part of a living system. And they support a diversity of insects. And those insects support birds and salamanders and fish and on and on, and bats, and so on and so forth. So just these alone are supporting many different species of honeybees, small and medium-sized butterflies, wasps, flies, beetles, leafhoppers. And here's a list of the moths that are supported by heath asters and others within that, that genus. 
Here's another one. Virginia creeper. A plant that many of us would be like, there's no way. I'm not having that in my landscape. I'm certainly not going to use it. I'm not even going to bother with it. In fact, I'm going to kill it wherever I find it. But Virginia creeper is native to most parts of, of, of the Midwest. It's certainly native here in Indiana. And it supports 16 different moth, butterfly, moth species and at least 30 different birds. It's part of a living landscape. Now, that doesn't mean we need to have it growing all over our house, but it certainly allows us to realize this species is fine out on the landscape. And when it's growing with other things, it is providing the necessary food to support a diverse assemblage of wildlife. Just a few more to kind of give you, wet your whistle a little bit, but native plums support about 456 different moth and butterfly species across North America. Our native blueberries support 288 different moth and butterfly species across North America. And you can cover this list if you get down there to the bottom, spice bush, another one that many people think, uh-uh, not having it in my woods, but it's native and therefore it's part of a living landscape. It supports spice bush swallowtail larvae, thrushes, rough grouse, wild turkey songbirds, deer, small mammals, and so on. So I mentioned that these native plants and these insects, they have a relationship. Well, how long does it take to develop that relationship? If we introduce these species from afar, we bring them in and they're here for a long time, surely they're supporting assemblage of insects that will support other wildlife. Let's take a look. Paper bark tree, kind of right here in the middle. It's been here for about 120 years. It's actually more. This is a little bit of an old slide. In its native habitat, it supports about 409 Lepidopteran species. After 120 years in North America, about eight. Let's look at common reed, the species that was all around and ringing that lovely little fin that we just found. Been here over 300 years. Native range, 170 species here in North America. After 300 plus years, five. This is wonderful. In the native range, all of these species are doing exactly what they're supposed to do. In their native range, they are supporting life. They're part of a living landscape. Bring them over here. And after 300 plus years, they're not doing the same job that they were doing in their native range. It's just not going to happen. So how long does it take to develop that relationship? We don't know yet. But in the meantime, if they're creating monocultures here, we're losing the diversity here. I do want to introduce one more concept before I start to kind of wrap up, and that's to save place. Oftentimes we focus on a species such as this lovely pale purple coneflower, and we think, wow, that is absolutely stunning. Let's spread it everywhere. Unfortunately, that's not the best thing to do in most cases. This glade um, is Teeple Glade, and it's here in Harrison County. It's one of the glades that I've had the, for the good fortune to work on. And what we did in, in these glades, and there are many glades peppered all over Harrison County, and this is the only one after removing invasive species that pale purple coneflower grows on. We do not take pale purple coneflower seed and spread it to all of the other glades. Each glade is different. And as beautiful as this flower is, for whatever reason, we want to, we want to, to spread it and have other glades have the same species, but for whatever reason, it does not grow on the other glades. They have their own suite, their own assemblage, and their own living landscape, and that keeps things diverse. So it's just a food for thought for us as we are doing restoration work and thinking about, um, you know, what plant groups, what plants that we're going to use in our landscape. The more diverse, the more local you can possibly be then the more diverse the outcome will be. So as you're doing restoration, be sure that you're planting for pollinator life cycle needs. And that means you're using natives, a plethora of them, 
Natives help bees over winter. They provide nectar sources. And their diversity allows us to steer clear of monocultures. And I've shown you some pretty devastating pictures. And I've talked about some devastation related to monocultures. Another species to kind of think about as we're thinking about like pale purple, spreading pale purple coneflower and other things like that is yucca filamentosa, a wonderful pollinator plant. But you can see its native range on the left hand map up there on the left hand side of the screen. If we're in Indiana, and that's where I am now, and pale, this uh, yucca filamentosa only grows its native range is just the southern portion of Indiana, just barely north of the Ohio River. We're having a tendency, or where I live in Brown County, um, yucca filamentosa has been planted and used quite a bit here, and it's touted as, as a wonderful pollinator plant. No doubt in my mind that it is. I see that it's covered. It's also host to a very specific moth, the yucca moth. But it's outside of its range when it's in Brown County. And quite frankly, it's aggressive and it's spreading. Um, it is covering fields. It is covering um, uh, pasture land and early successional areas. And it's being aggressive and it is displacing those native plants that would provide and maintain the diversity here. So again, we're taking something that may be native to North America, but is it really a good choice to move it around where it has the ability to displace other species? Something for us to think about and think about the definition of native and invasive. So just a couple of things, you guys probably know this, but I know this is another one that I hear all the time. You know what? We don't need to get rid of these things because they're providing, look at all of the insects. They're providing nectar sources and food sources for insects. But again, calorie pear is extremely invasive. This is, um, again, this mitigated area that I was showing you earlier, and this is throughout the entire state. This plant species, even though it may be good for a couple of insects, it is absolutely a loss on the landscape. It displaces many, many other species. And we don't need to keep it. We need to allow that diversity to flourish instead of creating another monoculture. Autumn olive, another one that I hear is touted as a wonderful pollinator plant. No doubt in my mind, I see this thing covered in insects a lot in the spring, but this is a nitrogen fixer. It alters the ecosystem and it creates monocultures. This is the last thing we need. This is not diversity and this is a decline and a cascading negative effect on the ecosystems where this is invading. Non-native privets, again, another one that creates monocultures. It is poisonous to humans and it contains chemicals that inhibit digestion. This is not part of a living landscape and it may be good for a few insects, but overall it has a cascading negative effect on life. Crown vetch, the same way. It's a nitrogen fixer alters that soil, creates in, um, a, a different chemical composition, and those native plants that depend upon an infertile soil are no longer able to survive where this is growing. This one also alters the fuel loads and changes the fire intensity and creates monocultures of itself. So again, not a good choice. Wild parsnip is another one. Um, it is, it's stunning, it's beautiful, but this thing, um, not only will it blister and cause severe rashes for us if we touch the sap, but it's highly invasive. It is a threat to agriculture, and it is a loss of habitat for pollinators and wildlife, as well as a loss of diverse nectar sources. Garlic mustard has been in the news lately is, you know what, this thing will actually just kind of peter out over time and go away. But in the meantime, when it's here, it's releasing chemicals that our native mustards do not. And those chemicals are deadly to several insects, two of them, the West Virginia white butterfly and the falcate orange tip. If they lay their eggs and they are attracted to this, even if their native mustards are nearby, they'll lay their eggs and those eggs do not survive. 
So the future of those butterflies is in decline when this species is around and it's everywhere. This species also um, has a tendency to uh, depress or suppress uh, new seedling, uh, new tree seedling growth, as well as uh, negatively impact the mycorrhizal um, in the soil that's in the area that it's infected. So yeah, we could wait. We don't know how long we could actually wait before this thing will actually start to die out. And in the meantime, it's continuing to spread. So I've seen infestations and in areas that have inf been infested for 20 plus years. So how long do we wait? I would challenge us to go ahead and eliminate it. A couple more, here's Sweet Autumn Clematis. We have a native Clematis that's very, very similar to this, Virgin's Bower. Virgin's Bower behaves, Sweet Autumn Clematis, even though it does support likely the same insects as our native does, our native does not behave like this. This is 35 acres on the right-hand side and about 20 on the left. This, uh, the one on the left is under current um, uh, restoration and they are struggling to get it under control. And the one on the right, they haven't even begun and it's continuing to spread. And all of these are trees that are covered by sweet autumn clematis. Looks a lot like kudzu. If we just choose the native, we wouldn't have this problem. So just to kind of wrap it up, Please also be aware that commercial wildflower mixes, they really are a no-go. Many of them contain species from other continents and other countries, and they also may contain species that are even not native to your area of North America. And as I've harped on throughout this entire presentation, we really need to go native. That's where living landscapes are. That's the diversity that we need. So the goal of restoration, hopefully, is holistic and diverse planning. We should think about and include in our plans that potential for impacts to many species, not just maybe our target species, not just monarchs, not just pollinators, but also birds. How about the mussels? So that would mean we have runoff that's healthy. We have our erosion under control. That we're positively impacting spiders, herps, and so on and so forth. We need to realize that all of these are part of a functioning system, relationships. Invasives create holes in the web or the tower of life. While natives are the solution if we're going to increase habitat and have living landscapes. So one more time to give you one more taste to kind of not just rub it in, but just to let you know that natives really are the solution. Oak species support over 534 different moth and butterfly species across North America. Maples, 285. Highbush blueberry, 288. Plus all of the other species on the right-hand side. And this is just talking really about insects. There's many more species that also benefit from using our natives. So know that you make a difference. Please choose to grow native. At some point, we have to stop making the mistake and thinking, well, this non-native will be okay. I will take care of it and I won't let it get out of control if it starts to do that. We don't always have the control that we think we do over wind, water, and so on and so forth that mother nature can throw at us. So please know that going native truly is the solution. These are a couple of resources that you can look at, Indiana Native Plant Society. If you're Indi in Indiana, Purdue Extension offers amazing um, brochures and information on attracting pollinators. And if you want to know about invasives, check out Sikkim's website as S-I-C-I-M dot I-N-F-O. So I'll leave you with a case for nature and the use of, of native species. I think we've made our case today. But also to intrigue you just a bit more, Michael McCarthy wrote a book called Moth Snowstorm. And he asked in this book, as he's making his case for the use of natives and, and a connection to nature, is where are the moths? 
You know, when I first started driving, I can remember that the headlights of my car at night would just be covered in moths. Covered. I mean, you would have to wipe them off if you wanted to have headlights to see at night. I drive all over many nights throughout the year, all over Indiana, rural areas, urban areas, it doesn't matter. I never move a moth off of my headlight. Not anymore. If moths are feeding so many amazing things, bats eat moths, birds eat moths, other animals eat moths, insects feed the world, and yet I never even clean them off of my windshield or my headlights. Where are they? We can do a lot by thinking about going native. So I hope you will consider that. And I hope you will check it out at night and wonder where the moths are. It's not, of course, just all habitat. It's a comp compilation of many things, but certainly making sure that we have native species in our landscape and in our restoration areas, true natives, will help. We don't want to make this mistake again. This certified wildlife habitat sign is amongst plants that are not native. They're not eaten by any insect and therefore they are not wildlife habitat. So I'll leave you with that. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it gave you something to think about and I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you again and have a good one. Thank you, Dawn, for that highly informative presentation. Um, and with that, we'd like to invite Dawn to come off mute and start her video. And we'd like to invite you all to ask your questions in the Q&A function box if you haven't yet already. All right, it looks like we have Dawn on the line. Um, our first question is, how far out of range can we go to obtain near native species? I'm thinking of climate change and that many species slightly out of range now will find their own way forward. There's often talk of building climate ready landscapes, which often includes obtaining species or genotypes, seed sources from places slightly closer to the equator. Is this a bad practice? Uh, that's a really good question. And I don't know that we have all of the answers to that at this point. Um, you know, I, we do a lot of restoration work at the Nature Conservancy, and I'm sitting here now in the middle of one today because we're, we're working today. And we do our best to look at historical documents, and we really do try hard to get what should be here, what's historically documented. We, we can't really predict what's going to happen. We don't have all of the answers as climate change moves. So I, honestly, I can't, we work hard to make sure that we're getting and, and using what should be here, what, his, what, is, what was historically here. And I don't know that I can give any other advice because I honestly, we don't know. So it's a great question. I know we're all thinking about it. Um, but if we don't give our natives here a chance, we don't know how long it takes to develop those relationships. I just, I cannot comfortably answer that question and say, yes, you should just go and move some of those that are closer to the south up here. I don't know that we know exactly what's going to happen to the climate either. So I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> I'm not trying to dodge it. I'm just trying to be honest. <laughs> that's a good that's a good answer and, and a very good question. Assisted, the question of assisted migration is, is a hot topic. Yeah. Um, we have another question. Uh, what if I have a non-native in my yard that attracts pollinators? Isn't, isn't it providing a needed resource and should I leave it? That's another good one. Of course it is. It's absolutely providing um, that habitat needs uh, for, those, for those insects. But I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share this story with you. I'll be quick. Someone asked me, um, they came to me after listening and, and meeting with me and walking around some sites and they said, well, I've got this stuff in my yard and I've, I planted these things and I've nursed them. And yeah, I can see they're kind of, they're kind of taking over and they're, they're kind of starting to, to, to move and move some of my natives out of the way. And, you know, she said, I just don't feel like I should cut it down because all living things should have a chance to live. And I said, you know, I agree completely, 100%. I'm with you. And 
it's not that all non-natives are going to be aggressive and take over, but if they are displacing natives, then they're also, they're, then most likely they're displacing those native insects that would use that native plant that is being displaced by the non-natives. So again, just, you know, taking in what's going on in your landscape, altered urban landscapes are, are a novel thing in their own, their own right. And it's not always detrimental to have a non-native, but just think long-term um, and do as much native as you possibly can. Thank you. Our next question, um, Jack asks, uh, can you also briefly talk about allopathic plants and their effects on native plants and soil health? Well, I mean, certainly that, that does happen. One of the examples I used was garlic mustard. Um, uh, th th there's a bunch of them, vetch, autumn olive. Um, those chemicals certainly do um, alter, it can alter growth patterns for, for native species. We don't know the answer to all of those either. We have some that we've studied and that we know about, garlic mustard, for instance, being one. We know that it negatively impacts um, uh, the growth pattern of even trees. We know that it can impact the mycorrhizal relationship in the soil. So we only know about a few of them, which is, I think that's kind of an, a new study that's starting. And that's, again, I don't, there's so much we have yet to learn. What we do know is some of those invasives are certainly having a negative impact. Autumn olive is one, mimosa um, may even be one as it's moving. So we know that's there and, and it would depend upon the species that, that we're talking about to get down in the dirt and decide exactly what species is doing what. But garlic mustard is a fine example. We know for instance, that it is severing that communication that's going on between the fungi and soil and the trees itself. So there are lots of examples. Thank you. So we have time for one more question. Um, the last question will be, uh, we hear invasive shrubs like buckthorn do not do well with intense shade. Have you heard of anyone suppressing buckthorn by regenerating aspen or other similar uh, clonal native species in order to smother populations of woody invasives? And that is a great question. And I'll be, I do not have an answer for that. Um, I have primarily worked here and uh, done some work in Tennessee, a little bit in Kentucky, and then primarily here in Indiana. And you, I do not have an answer. We've not been successful here. Um, typically buckthorn takes over whatever we're doing. So I, that's a great question. And, and if somebody has that knowledge, share it or some information about that. Fantastic. Thank you again, Don. Thank you. And with that, I am thrilled to introduce our next speaker, Nathan Hahn. Nate is an ecologist and postdoc researcher at Michigan State University. His research focuses on the interactions between insects and plants with the goal of using ecological science to help inform biodiversity conservation and agricultural sustainability. Nate completed his PhD at the University of Washington and his master's at the University of Michigan. Please welcome Dr. Nathan Hahn. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Nate Hahn. I'm a research associate in the Department of Entomology at Michigan State University. Um, and Elizabeth asked me to talk to you today about implications from current research on managing monarch and other native pollinator habitat. Um, I think I have about a half hour to do this. so. Um, this is a huge, huge research topic, so I'm just going to barely skim the surface on a couple of topics, um, mostly centered on monarch butterflies and then occasionally spilling over into uh, implications for managing other native pollinator habitat. Um, yeah, my understanding is in previous uh, sessions you've had background on the basic biology of monarch butterflies and on the current listing status, so I'm going to skip that stuff and jump straight into the research. Okay. So what I'd like to do today is a little different from other monarch-related talks that I've given. Instead, I want to take the title pretty literally and talk about a couple of research topics related to monarch butterflies and discuss some of their uh, conservation implications. And the research topics are centered on four issues. Um, the first of them is the loss of milkweed from Midwestern landscapes and then the prospects for um, building it back into our landscapes. Um, the second research topic has to do with nectar resources for monarchs, both along the migratory pathway and then some in the breeding range. Uh, 
Uh, the third has to do, there's at least one study I want to look at um, that has to do with small scale garden design and implications for um, how to place milkweed so that it's accessible to monarchs. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about the relationship between ecological disturbance and management and um, milkweeds and monarchs and some of the work that I've been involved with. One part of my uh, research effort is dedicated to that project. Um, great. So here we go. Okay, so our first topic is uh, the loss of milkweed from the uh, U.S. Midwest. So milkweeds are monarchs' uh, obligate host plant that they lay their eggs on. Uh, they focus on many species within the genus Asclepius, but especially Asclepius syriaca because it's really, really common. Um, and it used to, it, it's still a really common fixture in uh, Midwestern landscapes, but it used to be much more so, especially because it was uh, present and very common in corn and soybean fields. So it's been estimated that we lost somewhere around 40% of common milkweed stems from the Midwest. And that occurred because since the 1990s, uh, almost all corn and soy growers have switched to using herbicide resistant crops. Uh, so they can now just spray their fields with glyphosate and it kills all the weeds in the field, but the crops persist. Um, and that has eliminated millions and millions and millions of milkweed stems from the landscape. Um, whether that is the root cause of monarch decline or whether it's one contributing factor, how important it is, that's an area of ongoing research and quite a bit of debate. So I'm not really going to weigh in on that, but I do think um, given that so much milkweed has been lost from the Midwest, it's probably part of, at least part of the equation um, alongside climate change and loss of nectar resources and other things. So anyway, the, the study that I wanted to highlight first here um, is by John Pleasance, and he set out to uh, try to estimate how much milkweed has been lost from Midwestern landscapes and how to get it back. And the way he did that was by looking at past studies that quantified milkweed densities in different habitats and then mapping out where those habitats are and calculating um, all the corn and soy fields that are now uh, treated with herbicides, so deleting all that milkweed out of the landscape, and then how many other habitats have been converted to corn and soy uh, as part of just land use change and land conversion over time. And so he crunched the numbers there and estimates, that's how we got our estimate of a loss of about 40% of common milkweed stems from the Midwest, or something like 800 million stems, due again to glyphosate-resistant crops and land conversion. So another study I want to highlight then takes that and looks forward and says, okay, what are our prospects for building milkweed stems back into Midwestern landscapes? Can we put them back, given that they can no longer occur in corn and soy fields. And so this study, and the figure on the right here is from that study, um, endeavored to look at some different scenarios for what that could look like. And there were all sorts of different combinations of management techniques. And uh, the, the vertical axis on this figure uh, shows the number of milkweed stems uh, added back into the landscape. And the goal is sort of that red dotted line you see there. And you can see that almost all the different combinations of scenarios did not come close to adding enough milkweed back into the landscape because we are losing out on so many milkweed stems that were in corn and soy fields uh, before uh, the last 20 years or so. Um, and I guess the details aren't super important here to, for our purposes, but um, one of the take home points is the very few scenarios that got us over the finish line to um, having enough milkweed stems involved really radical landscape changes like um, converting half of marginal agricultural land, so like 12 per, or all or half, 12% or 6% of agricultural land into conservation grassland planting. So really huge areas. Um, that was enough to get us over the finish line. Um, and then in combination with lots of other things like increasing the amount of organic agriculture on landscape, changes to management of rights of way, urban milkweed plantings, all of that stuff. But I guess the take home was just in order to, if your goal is to add back the milkweed stems that have been deleted out of the landscape, it would take really, really radical landscape scale changes to make that happen. So it's an interesting point that they made. 
So one of the key resources that monarchs need is nectar from diverse sources that occur throughout the season. So just like larvae feed only on milkweed, the adults depend on nectar from flowers to fuel their flight as they search for mates or find milkweed plants to lay their eggs on or as they migrate. Um, so in terms of research on this, there was an interesting study from some of my fellow scientists at Michigan State. This study came out in 2019 and uh, showed the importance of nectar availability along monarch's southern migratory pathway. So they used remotely sensed data, like from satellites, um, that and detected the quote-unquote greenness of the landscape along the migratory pathway, so especially down in Texas, that area. Um, and that's what, on the, on the figure that you see on the right, NDVI is basically a remotely sensed index of how green the landscape is, and that's a proxy for how much nectar is available in a given year for uh, butterflies as they fly south. Um, and they found that years with greener autumns, or more nectar, uh, ended up with bigger overwintering colonies of monarchs in Mexico. So to me, this raises two points. First, it's critical that we maintain complex landscapes uh, with floral resources available in this part of North America, um, especially like central Texas. Um, and second, this is kind of a key vulnerability related to climate change. If vegetation ends up drying out earlier or there's more droughts later in the season and in the fall, uh, monarchs are less likely to find enough nectar to be able to refuel and make their way down to Mexico. Um, and then second, nectar sources are also important in the breeding range uh, where I live in Michigan. Um, and I'm not aware of studies showing that nectar availability in our region like predicts overwintering population size or anything like that. But in very simplified landscapes in the Midwest that are dominated by corn and soybeans, uh, just like monarchs can't find milkweed, they're also not going to have much opportunity to refuel with nectar. Um, so in general, we need nectar for monarchs and all other nectar feeders, lots of pollinators. Uh, in order for them to be abundant, they need to find diverse uh, sources of nectar, and those sources need to occur throughout the season to minimize the temporal gaps in the season that could occur. Um, so here's a I, I want to highlight a, a species list that's provided by the Xerces Society, um, and they have different regional species lists. I'll highlight the Great Lakes one because that's where I am. Um, and I know, I'll go to the next slide here. Um, hopefully this link we can share with everybody uh, later on. Next slide. Come on. There we go. Okay. So I know that this list is probably too small for you to read, uh, but it shows how you can decide what to seed or what to plant in a conservation planting or in a garden. And it's based on bloom time um, or in a garden context, like based on color, uh, watering needs, and so forth. Um, so this gives you some information on several species usefulness, um, both to monarchs and then to other species too. So for example, uh, bee balm or wild bergamot, Monarda fistulosa, is um, something monarchs really like to use. Um, it's also a total bumblebee magnet. So this is a picture I took this summer of Bombus oricomus, the black and yellow bumblebee or black and gold bumblebee um, on bee balm. So it's a total bee magnet, really cool plant that um, brings in all kinds of different insects, including monarchs. Let's see. Next, New England Aster is another great one that's on that list. Um, used to be Aster noviangli, now it's Symphiotrichum noviangli. Um, and this is one that monarchs will use. It, it flowers in the fall, like in September, and it turns out to be quite important for uh, queen bumblebees that are have just emerged and are getting ready to overwinter and helping them uh, fuel up and prepare for the next year. So that's a cool one. Uh, one that I like is uh, Missouri ironweed. Uh, this one brings in a lot of butterflies. I see a lot of monarchs on it, also swallowtails and several bees, types of bees as well. Okay, and then I want to highlight a little bit of um, research again from Michigan State. Uh, this one's a few years old, but this is from a series of studies in which uh, folks planted a whole bunch of native species that they thought would be good at attracting beneficial insects, be they pollinators, uh, including monarchs, or natural enemies, uh, meaning the predatory and parasitic arthropods that 
attack crop pests and are useful that way in an agricultural setting. So what they did is planted an array with many different native plant species and then sampled them, observed them throughout the season to see uh, which arthropods and how many were visiting them when they were flowering. Uh, and then also used like vacuum suction to pull off other arthropods on the plant to count up how many uh, natural enemies were using that plant in one way or the other. And so this is one of the products of that, this list here that shows, um, I don't know, 20 some native species and they're arranged in order of bloom time. So uh, if one were to have all these species in a planting or in a conservation planting, it would give, you know, May to October coverage in terms of always having something blooming. Um, and then it shows here, uh, in general, whether they had, how many native, uh, natural enemies and, uh, pollinators were visiting each of them. So this is a cool species list as well. Um, maybe after this talk, I can provide links to all these studies and stuff to uh, share the details for anyone who's interested. All right. So another cool recent study that I want to highlight is something that came out of University of Kentucky. And this is, if you're thinking at really fine scales about how to design um, a, like a small pollinator way station or a monarch way station or a garden that butterflies will visit. Um, and they did something really simple here. They, um, they were interested in the spatial configuration or spatial arrangement of milkweeds and other plants and how that influences how attractive or accessible milkweed plants are to monarchs. So they did a simple study where they had um, a garden. This wasn't even like native species mostly, uh, but it included milkweed. I think it looks like swamp milkweed from the pictures. Um, and there were three garden configurations. So it was the same species in all of these gardens, um, but in treatment A that you see on the left here, all the, all the non-milkweed species were clustered in the middle and milkweed was arranged in an alley around the the outside, so it was on the edge, super um, accessible and, you know, out, out on the edge of the garden. Uh, and then in treatment B, they flipped that and milkweed was all packed into the middle of the garden and then it was surrounded on the outside by other species. And then treatment C, here on the right, everything was just intermixed together. And then they visited those gardens and counted up how many monarch eggs uh, they found. And the results are on the right here. And you can see that when milkweed was planted on the perimeter, they found a lot of eggs. Uh, and when it was on the interior or intermixed with the other species, uh, there were quite a few fewer eggs. And that happened both in 2017 and then they repeated the study in 2018, a really strong pattern. So that's a really interesting suggestion that uh, monarchs either are more able to detect or more able to lay eggs on or more interested in laying eggs on uh, milkweed plants that are like visually that are on the edge of a planting or that are more uh, prominent sticking out. So that's an interesting finding there. And if you're interested in uh, planting your own, you know, butterfly garden, thinking about putting some milkweed on the outside where it's extra obvious, uh, it might receive a lot more eggs. So that was a cool study there. All right, and last I'd like to talk a little bit about the research that I've led and that my boss, Doug Landis, has led, looking at the uh, role of ecological disturbance in influencing milkweed and monarch butterflies. Uh, so just to back up and set the stage a little bit, uh, these photos here are of some other endangered butterflies that uh, declined because their habitat was destroyed, but also because the disturbance regimes that they depended on were dismantled. And in these cases, these are mostly habitat specialists that were... Um, dependent on fire, and in one case, grazing. And part of successful recovery for these butterflies has included building back in the disturbance regimes that they depend on. So it's not just about how much habitat or whether their host plants are present, but also whether the processes that they uh, depend on are there. So that got us wondering, monarchs are super different from these types of endangered butterflies that are habitat specialists and only occur in, you know, really particular habitat types. Monarchs are all over the place. Uh, but it got us wondering if monarch butterflies could also be dis disturbance-dependent butterflies. They do occur in landscapes where there's quite a bit of ecological disturbance. All right, so there are some clues in the literature and in past observations about the potential for a relationship between disturbance and monarchs. 
Um, first of all, we know that milkweed in crop fields was mechanically disturbed during the summer for most of the 20th century. So weed control depended on mechanical cultivation that uh, killed seedlings and would have knocked back milkweed um, up until the 1990s when things shifted over to being herbicide based. Second, we know that common milkweed is quite resilient through disturbance. If you've ever tried to mow it down or cut it down or pull it up, you'll often find that new stems pop up a couple of weeks later. Um, and third, there are studies showing that monarchs tend to prefer young or regenerating milkweed stems for overposition over the older stems. Um, and they've been observed in past studies using regenerating milkweed stems in, for example, hay fields after they've been mowed. So we set out to do a study to experimentally look at the effects of disturbance and regenerating milkweed stems after disturbance on monarchs. So we located I think, 23 milkweed patches in a study we did in 2018 and 2019. And these were located in and around the East Lansing, Michigan State University area. And in each milkweed patch, we divided it in thirds. Um, one third we left alone as a control. One third we cut back in June and another third we cut back in July. And we used like string trimmers that had brush blade attachments added to them. Uh, so we cleared out milkweed and the surrounding vegetation. Um, so this little plot on the left shows you what a milkweed patch would have looked like in mid-August with a third of it maybe starting to senesce a little bit. One third having several weeks of regrowth after cutting back in June and one third with uh, newer regrowth from being cut back in July. And here's what that looked like in real life. Here's a, um, this is a successional grassland at a state game area. Um, one third of it just now cut in June. One third will be cut in about a month. And we visited these patches every week or so during the summer and we counted up uh, monarch eggs and larvae and uh, arthropod predators that eat them as well. And here's what we found. The regenerating milkweed stems received quite a few more eggs than the controls. So in these figures on the right, the horizontal axis is a timeline and then the vertical axis is the number of monarch eggs and first and star caterpillars that we found per stem, so monarch density. The orange line here is the control plots. That's sort of the background rate. Um, the blue line here is uh, stems that regrew after being cut back in June. And you can see that in 2017, there were maybe moderately more eggs. In 2018, there was quite a bit higher density. Um, and then this greenish line towards the end of the summer that pops up is uh, milkweed stems that started to regenerate in August after disturbance in July. See densities of monarchs were quite high on them. So they do like to use regenerating milkweed stems for overposition. We were also interested in counting up predators on milkweed stems. Between something like 80 to 90 some percent of monarch eggs and early instar caterpillars de just die because they're eaten by other arthropods. That's sort of the norm in arthropod communities, uh, but it's still a really important uh, variable that you know predicts how many can make it through to adulthood. So we were interested in looking at um, there was a difference in the number of arthropod predators, and there were. So again, the orange the orange line here is the control plots with no disturbance, and then when new stems popped up, like in this blue line and then the green line here, when new stems popped up in the weeks after disturbance, for the first few weeks there were few to no predators on those stems, and then the community gradually reassembled so that by several weeks later there were uh, quite a few milkweed stems, or quite a few uh, arthropods predatory arthropods on the milkweed stems. So we've shown that monarchs lay more eggs on the new stem, there are fewer predators, and then we wanted to know, does that translate into higher survival for a monarch larvae? So uh, this figure here is from a follow-up study we did in which we took, I think about 1,300 first instar monarch caterpillars, and we put them on milkweed stems that were either regrowing after disturbance or control stems and found early in the season that uh, stems that were cut back in June were had survival rates that were between two and two and a half times higher than the control stems. And then we did it again later in the summer, at which point the stems that had regenerated from disturbance in June were not different from the control, control stems, but the fresh stems that had come up after disturbance in July uh, had very high survival rates. So yes, it does seem to translate into higher survival, at least in the first 48 hours of life for monarchs. It's pretty interesting. We were also wanted to broaden out, not just think about monarchs, especially since we're testing a management strategy that would have implications for all sorts of other organisms, right? 
So we want to denote what will happen to floral resources and to other pollinators because when you cut down a patch of milkweed, you're also cutting down all the other stuff that lives there too. Um, I want to point out at this point, we were not working in super pristine habitats. Uh, these were not like native prairies generally. They were successional old fields, roadsides, that type of environment dominated by cool season grasses. So that's where we were working, but there's still a lot of uh, floral resources there. So again, same kind of figures here on the right show that in the control plots, this is the number of flowers over the course of the season. And after disturbance, there was a period of three to four weeks where there were fewer floral resources, and then they sort of recover after that. Uh, in tracking the bees, wasps, and hoverflies that visited those plants, again, there was a three to five week period where there were fewer of them, and then um, later on in the season, there was no difference between uh, control plots and the disturbed ones. So, yeah, there's some uh, setback to floral resources and a reduction in the number of visitors. However, there's also sort of a silver lining to it in that some plant species will then flower after regenerating at a different time in the season, which diversifies the overall flowering phenology and could extend the bloom window a bit. So just as an example, here's four species. I'll, I'll focus on, on common milkweed itself, uh, which is an important nectar resource for lots of things in addition to being a uh, monarch's host plant. The orange line here is their flowering phenology um, given no disturbance. The green line that's just flat, that's what happens if they're disturbed in July. They just don't flower after uh, disturbance. But if they're disturbed in June, um, they're basically cut back when they're budding. And then the new stems regenerate and flower in August. And they actually end up spreading out the overall bloom window. So in landscapes where there are temporal gaps in flowering plants, uh, resources for bees that could actually diversify phenology and help plug some of those gaps. So that's one way to think about it. And we're still sort of figuring that out. And around the same time that we were working on this, another group at University of Guelph uh, was doing something pretty complimentary. So this is from a paper by Samantha Knight um, showing uh, results from roadsides that were mowed at all different times during the summer and found that uh, monarch eggs were more abundant on the regenerating milkweeds, especially if the uh, disturbance happened in July. If it happened much after July uh, or after early mid July, then there were uh, there was a lot of mortality to monarchs that were already using those milkweed stems and less overposition. So it was a bad idea after that point. So interesting complementary study there. All right, and then finally, we were interested, given these cool, promising results that we'd pulled up from local studies, we were interested in scaling up and seeing uh, if these patterns hold true uh, in other contexts and uh, in other parts of the country, etc. So this was also around the time that COVID-19 hit, so we couldn't do the normal research uh, field studies that we had planned and we had to sort of pivot. So we came up with this community science project, Regrow Milkweed for Monarchs. Maybe you heard of it, maybe you even participated in it. Um, yeah. So we basically asked people to do the same study that we had done previously uh, or along those lines in their own backyard or in other places that were available to them. So we built a website and a YouTube channel with instructions for how to do it and an app and Google Sheet or Google uh, forms to submit data to us. And then folks cut back milkweed all over the country and uh, let us know what happened. So basically it was a little bit simplified. We took a patch of milkweed, each each participant took a patch of milkweed, divided it in half, and cut back half the stems, left the other half as a control. Uh, and the timing of when they did it was really variable, and then they used whatever tools were available to them. So we got like a big shotgun blast of data that we could sort of pick apart and see what happens. Um, so overall, we had a great response to this. We had almost 3,000 people sign up for updates on the project. We had more than 500 people um, sign up and initially uh, cut back milkweed to submit data. And then from that, around 150 milkweed patches ended up uh, yielding data that, that we could use because it was in the geographic area we wanted. Um, and that folks submitted data for enough weeks after the initial disturbance that we could include it in our data set. So super cool project. It was a lot of fun. Good thing to do uh, when everyone was kind of shut up in their houses over that summer. Um, and just some data exploration here. Most people cut back milkweed with hand tools, just a few used power tools. So that's different from what we had done with string trimmers and brush blades originally. 
Most of the sites were in suburban landscapes as opposed to other types. Um, and most milkweed patches were in people's gardens or lawns as opposed to other contexts like the grasslands that we had initially worked in. And here's what we found. Overall, regenerating milkweed stems actually hosted slightly fewer monarchs overall. So that was a surprise. It's different from what we'd found previously. Uh, this figure on the right, this is a, this is a box plot. Um, the thing to look at is this dark horizontal, bold horizontal line. That's the median. Half the values are greater, half the values are lower than that. Uh, but again, the regenerating milkweed stems had fewer monarch eggs, not more, uh, in this study. So that was different. Um, in trying to break apart the data set and figure out why that might be, um, if you look at the two figures on the right here, this is the data set divided up by what method people use to cut back milkweed. Um, so most of them used hand tools, just like hand pruners, and they cut back individual stems, leaving the surrounding vegetation intact. Um, and when that happened, you see the pattern that we observed overall with fewer monarch eggs on the new growth. However, for folks who use power tools and were generally cutting back milkweed and the surrounding vegetation, then we saw the pattern that we had seen in previous studies. So there's potentially positive effects when uh, using that sort of technique to cause disturbance. Um, why could that be? We can speculate. Uh, one of the possibilities relates back to the study I showed you from University of Kentucky in which um, the spatial arrangement and how much vegetation was around milkweed really mattered. So if you cut back individual stems, you're leaving the surrounding vegetation intact, and it might be that monarchs don't see the plant or don't want to lay eggs on it or can't access it or something, so there are fewer eggs laid. The other possibility is that by leaving the surrounding vegetation intact, we're also leaving the predator community intact, and that there could be the same number of eggs being uh, laid there, and they're just being removed by predators. Either is possible. Uh, but that's something we're interested in thinking about in the future and uh, maybe doing some follow-up work on. We've got some stuff in progress there. So finally, just to close out, I think it would be good to talk about when is management with disturbance appropriate and not. And it should be clear from the research I just shared that this is still something we're working on, and sometimes we found really compelling results, but then in other contexts, uh, like when we scaled it up, we did not see the same patterns. So it's still an area of active investigation, and people always ask really practical questions like, so should I mow everything? And no <laughs> is the short answer. Um, but it's, I think it's worth thinking about when could targeted management with targeted disturbance be appropriate. And, you know, not in pristine habitats, not when there's conflict with ground nesting bird management, not when there's a whole lot of floral resources that other pollinators are using that are getting mowed down. I think not if the disturbance is like, you know, introducing a new anthropogenic disturbance to a habitat that doesn't really need that. Uh, but there are also opportunities maybe to apply it to some habitats that monarchs use. Um, one option is burns during the growing season, which are a cool thing that does happen in native prairies and used to happen a lot historically and in certain contexts in habitat management could be appropriate. Um, another are places that are already mowed, like roadsides and hayfields. It could be that uh, the timing of disturbance in those kinds of environments could be tweaked to optimize monarchs and to avoid coming back and, um, you know, running over all the eggs that have been planted on the regenerating milkweed. So changing the timing of disturbance there could be really important. Uh, there are also lower diversity grasslands um, where some targeted disturbance may be appropriate, um, especially if we can focus on, like, small-scale micro disturbances as opposed to really broad, you know, blanket mowing and that sort of thing. So maybe this is something we can discuss more if people have management questions about when disturbance is or isn't appropriate. Um, it's something we're still thinking about uh, pretty carefully right now. All right. Well, thanks a lot for listening. Um, this concludes the pre-recorded part of my talk. Hopefully my dog wasn't too loud. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll look forward to chatting with you a little bit. Fantastic. Thank you, Nate. That was fascinating. And with that, we'd like to invite you all to post your questions if you haven't already done so. So the first question um, that comes up um, asks about uh, stems being uh, cut, uh, presumably with the mowing technique. Um, she's wondering if stems are cut while the plants are flowering and how that would affect nectar-seeking pollinators. Yeah, so I, I think I showed one little figure about this. Um, 
if you cut milkweed when it's flowering, you know, the flowers are gone and anything looking for those flowers isn't going to find them. So that's a really important consideration. Um, the timing of when we were experimentally cutting down stems, uh, we could, if you do it early, like in June, when they're just budding and not yet flowering, then they won't flower when they normally would, but they'll flower um, in August instead. So there's probably pros and cons to that. It's not available in July when most milkweed is flowering, but then it is available later in the season. Um, when we cut stems down later in the summer, in the middle of July, uh, they had a chance to flower before we cut them, but then when the, regen the regenerating stem didn't flower at all. So definitely pros and cons there, yeah. Thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, we know host plant relationships are important. Can you explain how tracking moths and butterfly presence can be a metric to restoration success in establishing new native sites? Yeah, good question. And I, I maybe don't know a lot about it, but what I can say is um, butterflies and presumably moths as well, they make good indicator species. So if you're able to you know, walk transects and record which butterfly species you're seeing. If you're seeing a lot of butterfly diversity, that's probably a good indication that there is a lot of diversity of other things too. Um, in some of my other research, we walk butterfly transects and um, butterflies respond really positively to the amount of, you know, flower diversity that is at a site and plant diversity in general. Um, so they make great indicator species that way, uh, which is which is good because they're really easy to identify without having to catch them and put them under a microscope. You can tell what they are. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question we have, um, how can we tweak the timing of mowing to better suit our regions? And was your study done in mid-Michigan? Yeah, good question. So our work was in, again, in Michigan. Um, and then when we scaled up to do this uh, community science project, that was like, a lot of folks across the breeding range. Um, and they, we basically, we, di we didn't have control over when people cut back milkweed. We just let them do it whenever worked for them, just because of the nature of having hundreds of people all over the place contributing data. Um, so we haven't dived into yet tweaking the exact timing, but there are probably considerations with, um, there, you know, there are times of the year in a given location where there's gonna be a lot more caterpillars and then where, the, where more of the cohort's gonna be in the adult phase. And uh, if there's more caterpillars on milkweed, then a disturbance event is gonna have more negative effects, mortality on those caterpillars. Uh, so that's something to think about. Um, in general, I, I think I also wanna say in terms of timing of disturbance, one, one of the big take homes for me for thinking about this is one of the things we can talk about is the pros and cons of using disturbance in a conservation, you know, as a new conservation tool. The other important thing to think about is how much disturbance already happens in the landscape and whether that disturbance is tuned in a way that is good for monarchs or neutral or bad. So imagining like a roadside or a hay field, those environments already get mowed for, you know, either harvesting hay or making roadsides, I don't know, aesthetically, whatever they mow roadsides, uh, visibility. Um, and when that happens, it creates a new flush of milkweed stems. And those are going to receive, based on the data we've collected, a lot of monarch eggs and they're gonna have a lot of caterpillars on them. And so there's a several week period then where there's gonna be a lot of monarchs on those new milkweed stems. So vegetation management practices that includes subsequent disturbances like over time. So if a roadside gets mowed in June and then again in the middle of July or something like that, it's possible that that second mowing is killing tons of monarchs. And there's, there's sort of an ecological trap that we've set up there by creating successive disturbance events. So that's one of the timing things that I think would be really important to think about tweaking in light of what we've learned. Does that make sense? Absolutely, thank you. Um, here's another question that, that is somewhat parallel to that. Um, how can I best plan my mowing to avoid harming other pollinators or nesting birds? Yeah, right. So, I mean, I think the ground nesting birds question, that's earlier, earlier in the summer, I think. I'm not a bird person. Um, the other thing, I, I think at this stage, we're not necessarily advocating that people should use mowing as a conservation tool. I think it's something where we're suggesting it, it has a really strong effect on monarchs. So it's something we should continue to explore and experiment with, you know, acknowledging that there's 
a lot of context dependencies for when it's appropriate and not. So um, I would say if you're thinking about doing this, do it experimentally. Like if you have a milkweed patch in your backyard, absolutely don't go mow down the whole thing. That would, don't do that. Um, but if you're thinking maybe divide it into sections and uh, go in with a string trimmer and knock down a little section of it and then make some observations and look at the stems that come back after disturbance versus the other ones and see if monarchs start using those newer stems later in the season and they they may but yeah there's a lot of context dependencies here so not knowing where you're located uh wouldn't want to make no specific recommendations absolutely and and sound sound guidance um Question about uh, your your research. Um, do you know what the perimeter of the test plots was in the design study, mode, tall, or short? The perimeter of the test plots? So we just went out and found patches of milkweed that had at least 100 stems in them. So they were usually maybe 10 meters by 30 meters, a, a patch of milkweed that then had several hundred stems within it. Um, and we weren't cutting things down to different heights. We were always using the same height. Uh, the, the snapshot that I showed with milkweeds at different heights is just given that the disturbances happened at different times in the season, the milkweed had, you know, regenerated to different heights, if that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, next question. Uh, with monarch restoration efforts, it seems there is a disp disproportionate emphasis put on planting common milkweed and not necessarily milkweed species in general. Is there any evidence that monarchs prefer common versus other species, or is that simply availability? I think it's mostly availability. Um, so there were some studies looking at monarchs that arrived in Mexico and using the chemical fingerprint of different milkweeds and maybe isotopes, I don't remember, to, to figure out what they had eaten as caterpillars. And it was something like 90% of them had eaten common milkweed. But again, if you go up to the Midwest, 90 some percent of milkweed is common milkweed. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm BSing you a little bit. I don't know the exact numbers, but um, common milkweed is a lot more common. I will say um, the research that we've done is with common milkweed because that's the most abundant species that monarchs are using. Um, in side-by-side -side comparisons, I think there have been some studies showing they really like to lay eggs on swamp milkweed as well. Um, in our work, we found that often early in the season, they would lay eggs on common milkweed, but in plots where we had other, other milkweed species present, oftentimes the larvae would crawl off when they got a little bigger and then they'd go eat a different species. Um, swamp milkweed tends to stay green a little longer in the season. I would say more diversity is better. Um, more nectar is better. So, um, I, you know, I, I also like in my front yard prairie that I planted, I didn't want a lot of common milkweed because it's really aggressive and it's going to, you know, take over. Um, so I had butterfly milkweed, swamp milkweed, world milkweed, other species, and then I, I let common milkweed stay a little further back from my front door because it's pretty weedy. Um, yeah, I would say in general, more milkweed is better and they will let them, give them the option to choose which one they want by having a lot of all of it available. And that's probably what's better for pollinators in general too. Absolutely, thank you. Um, a question about your citizen science project. Um, will, the, will the project be repeated? And if so, how can people get involved? We don't know. We decided not to do it in 2021, partly because uh, Liz, our uh, staff person who coordinated a lot of the social media presence and stuff, um, she took a new job and left our lab. So we didn't have somebody to run it this past summer. Um, I think we'll probably not do it next summer, but I'm not totally sure on that yet because we're still we're still cooking around the, the data that we had from the, the first round. And there's a small chance we'll redo it, but I'm sorry I don't have a, a clear opportunity for folks to participate. Yeah, if, if we come up with something, you'll hear about it. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Let us know and we'll share that with all our registrants as well. Okay, and we have time for one more question. Um, is there any advice for milkweed aphid control um, without affecting monarchs? Squish them with your fingers. <laughs> um, 
don't use insecticides. I, I, I don't, I'm not an insecticide expert, but I can't imagine that there would be a smart way to do that without having a lot of other effects on everything else. Um, yeah, I know sometimes like around where I live late in the season, Aphis nerii, the oleander aphid, the orange one, I think I'm remembering the name right. Uh, sometimes it just gets to like plague proportions and it's all over everything. Um, I tend to kind of, I like it because it, it brings in all kinds of other arthropods. I see them and I see the ants that are tending them and the lady beetles that are trying to eat them. And um, the whole community of arthropods comes out for those aphids, which is pretty fun. I understand they can be unsightly and um, maybe compete with monarchs somewhat, but I, in general, I think they can coexist. And if you're working at a small enough scale where it's just a couple of um, stems, just go out and squish them with your fingers. I think that's the main thing. Thank you again, Nate. Yeah, you bet. And with that, I am honored to introduce our next speaker, Rebecca Barrack. Becky is a conservation scientist at the Chicago Botanic Garden and an adjunct professor at Northwestern University and the Plant Biology and Conservation Program. Becky studies seed biology and biodiversity in restored tall grass prairies and decision making for restoration, particularly for seed mix design. Becky is also a co-founder and project lead of Plant Love Stories, a project that aims to collect and share stories about the plants that impact our lives. Please welcome Dr. Rebecca Barrick. Hi, my name is Becky Barak. I'm a conservation scientist at Chicago Botanic Garden and an adjunct professor at Northwestern University in the program in Plant Biology and Conservation. This is part of the Project Wingspan Pollinator Habitat Technical Training Workshop Series, and thank you for having me today. I'm going to be talking about establishing diverse prairie restorations. And there is so much to say about the topic of establishing diverse prairie restorations and only so much time in the session today. So I'm happy to take questions after the session, and I've included my email address here for anybody that would like to follow up and continue the conversation. So this is me in the field. This is me in a prairie plot experiment that I participate in at Morton Arboretum. And I just kind of wanted to show you me and one of my field sites so that we can get to know each other a little bit, um, even though we are in this virtual talk right now. And um, you can maybe see I'm dispersing some Dismodium seed on my field clothes in that photo. So I study biodiversity and restoration in the tall grass prairie. Illinois, the state where I live, was once 60% prairie. And now people argue whether there is a tenth or a hundredth of a percent of that original prairie remaining. The only way to get new prairie is through prairie restoration. In this talk today, we're gonna to talk about what does current research say about establishing prairie restorations? As part of this talk, I'm gonna share some results from a survey on factors influencing seed mix design for prairie restoration. This is based on 15 interviews and 134 responses to an online survey about seed mix design in particular and restoration planning in general. And this was from prairie restoration managers across the Midwestern United States. So it gives us some, a little bit of new data about what prairie restoration managers are thinking about when they design seed mixes for restoration and what types of techniques they use. Across the board, biodiversity is an important restoration objective for prairie restoration managers. 95% of respondents to our survey said that biodiversity was important or very important to their restoration projects in general and also to their seed mix design in particular. One thing that might be of interest to this crowd is that second only to biodiversity was the importance of habitat for pollinators, where 94% of respondents said that this was important or very important. 
But biodiversity was so important that not only did this many managers rank it as important or very important, but around half of managers chose biodiversity as their most important restoration objective. So when they were only able to select one, about half of them chose biodiversity. Why is biodiversity so important in restoration? Well, there are a few reasons, and one of them is that biodiversity is a goal in its own right. Another is that biodiversity is related to many other ecosystem functions that are also restoration goals. And thirdly, looking at biodiversity is a way to compare between restored habitats and remnants. So we know biodiversity is important, but there are many ways to define biodiversity. So imagine I was walking out into this prairie that you see here. This is at the Chicago Botanic Garden. There are so many ways that I could think about the diversity around me. One way might be to just count all of the species that I can see. And we call that species richness, and that's kind of what a lot of people think about when they think about um, biodiversity but there are so many different other ways. So for one thing, I can think about phenological diversity or diversity in biological timing. So when I look around at this sea of species, I can think about what are the bloom periods of each of these different species and how do those overlap across the growing season? And for those of you, everyone that's interested in pollinators, um, you know that that's a really important component of biodiversity. For me as a researcher, uh, some of the elements of biodiversity that I study, one of them is phylogenetic diversity, and that's diversity across the evolutionary tree of life. So instead of counting these species, I can think about them in terms of their plant families and in terms of how interrelated they are to one another. So for instance, here are four families that are represented within this prairie. Um, the legume or Fabaceae family, the sunflower or Asteraceae family, the mint or Lamiaceae family, and the grass or Poaceae family. Another thing we might think about is functional diversity. So again, when I go out into this prairie, instead of counting the species, or in addition to counting the species, I can think about the diversity of traits that are in that community. What is the diversity of flower colors across the plants that are here? or the diversity in leaf area or plant height or seed mass, which is a characteristic that's really important for things like establishment. So as part of that survey that I told you about, there was actually a lot of diversity measures that came out. Uh, these were all diversity measures that were mentioned in the interviews. So then we asked about these diversity measures in the online survey and we asked managers to select their most important biodiversity measure. Perhaps not surprisingly, the, the largest number of respondents chose a large number of species as their most important biodiversity goal. So that's, again, species richness, and that's how we typically do quantify biodiversity. But another important characteristic was having a range of plant functional types in the community. And the next couple of important um, biodiversity goals were having a range of different bloom periods across the growing season, which again, we know is important for pollinators and other wildlife, and support for a diversity of non-plant taxa, again support for pollinators and other wildlife. So we kind of go back to this idea that biodiversity is related to other ecosystem functions that are restoration goals, and the different ways of measuring biodiversity can connect to different ecosystem functions. So for instance, having a lot of plants blooming across the season and having a goal of supporting a diversity of non-plant taxa are both things that may be important to membership of Project Wingspan. Regardless of the specific restoration goals, um, there are common elements across all restorations or across many restorations. One thing is that um, for prairies especially, a lot of the times they, the 
remnant prairie that was there was um, completely destroyed for agriculture. And what that means is that there aren't really a lot of prairie plants remaining um, or any prairie plants remaining um, when managers start a prairie restoration. So we have to start with putting those plants back through the form of seed or plugs. Here is an example of a great figure um, which kind of shows the process of restoration across the top and across the bottom, the process of developing native seeds for use in restoration. This is a figure that's from a special issue in restoration ecology. This is open access, and I wanted to mention this in case anybody is, is interested in following up on these ideas. Um, so this is a special issue on uh, standards for native seeds and ecological restoration. And there are articles across many types that are relevant for restoration planners, ranging from seed planning, sourcing, and procurement, all the way through seed use in the field. Um, so I do recommend checking out that special issue for people that want to learn more. This is a figure from that special issue, and it covers the elements of a seeding plan from site preparation, um, any pretreatments or, or preparations that are necessary on the seeds themselves, seed delivery methods and equipment. So are the seeds going to be broadcast or the seeds going to be drilled through the actual seeding and then monitoring and management and then communication of results with a bunch of different stakeholders. So I think that these some of these elements of seeding and seeding plans are going to be covered in the next professional development in this series. Um, but I just wanted to kind of make the point here that there are a lot of moving parts when you think about developing a seeding plan and then actually seeding in a restoration. So I'm going to try and cover some of the topics that we think about as restoration researchers and that restoration managers think about, but I just kind of want to make the point that there is a lot going on here. In establishing a prayer restoration, site preparation is very important. And the site preparation is going to depend on the site history of the site to be restored. So we think a lot of times of prairie restorations happening on formerly agricultural land, but there are restorations that are happening in urban areas um, and lots of other places that have different land use histories. Regardless, in many cases, applying herbicide is an important component of site preparation. Another question that people are going to come across when they think about restoration planning is what should they be planting in the first place? Should they be establishing plants from seed or from plugs? And like many things in restoration, this represents a trade-off. Plugs are more expensive, but they establish faster because they're grown, they're, they're sensitive stages of seedling germination and emergence all happen in a greenhouse. They're, they're babied a little bit. Seeds, on the other hand, are cheaper, but they can take longer to establish. Again, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this prairie plot experiment at Morton Arboretum. And just as some background, this plot experiment has um, 127 native species in about 426 plots. And these species are planted out as monocultures and then mixtures. And we planted all the mixtures out from seeds and from plugs. So we have lots of different diverse mixtures where we can look at that the same species were established from seeds or from plugs. And that allows us to answer a lot of different diversity questions, but also some practical questions about the use of seed versus plugs. So in our experiment, we found that plots that were established from plugs had higher species richness slightly, but the gap closed over time. So that after three years of the experiment, um, there was only about one more species uh, in plug plots as compared to seed plots. But the seed plots and plug plots didn't differ in other measures of diversity that we tested. And while we expected all species to do better from plugs because they're kind of babied, we actually found that some species did better from seed. Um, another thing we noticed is that plugged plants tended to stay where they were 
and seed plots were more mixed. So it's a little bit hard to tell, but this is an example of a plug plot. You can see um, some specific individual species and they're kind of remaining in their clumps where they were planted as opposed to being spread out throughout the plot. In general, because of these differences in biodiversity and because of the um, relative expense of plugs versus seeds, we recommend seeding rather than planting plugs in most circumstances. In some circumstances where rapid establishment is necessary or if there are certain species that are really difficult to establish from seed, um, then plugs can be recommended. But in general, um, there is pretty good establishment from seed in a lot of cases. I will say another neat thing about seeds is that you can put out a lot more individuals when you are working with seeds than when you're working with plugs. Each seed is an individual, a unique genetic individual. And so you get a lot more chances for um, kind of the right genotype of seed to be in the right place when you're able to put out hundreds of seeds in an area rather than a single plug, for instance. Now, in order to plant the seeds, um, managers need to obtain the seeds. And from our survey and from the literature, we know that cost and availability of seeds are big constraints on restoration. Um, in terms of where managers get seeds from, in our survey, we found that 89% of restoration managers in the Midwest that we surveyed purchased seed, but only about 20% um, only purchased seed. There was also lots of wild collection, both from sites that the respondents managed and from other sites, as well as nursery grown seeds within their organization. And most respondents worked with multiple different sources of seeds. So they would buy some and they would wild collect some, or they would nursery grow some and they would wild collect some. Um, this is a recent paper from 2018 that kind of addresses this issue of supply of native plant material. And um, the article is called Restoring Species Diversity, Assessing Capacity in the U.S. Native Plant Industry. So what these authors found was that out of about 25,000 vascular plant taxa that are native to the United States, 26% of those are sold commercially. So there are a lot of species out there that you just cannot buy commercially. But one thing that's interesting is that for prairies, there's actually a higher percentage that are sold commercially. So they looked at a subset of species, about a thousand uh, highly desired plant species, and they found that 76% of those are sold commercially. And they explained that by looking at kind of the long history of prairie restoration and the fact that prairies are critically endangered. So um, perhaps that is why there are more species that are commercially available for prairies than for species in general. So even though there are a lot of species that are commercially available for prairie restoration, there are still a lot of species that managers would like to use in their restorations, but they can't because those species aren't available or they aren't available in the quantities that managers want, or there are biological issues with actually establishing those species. And two major groups of those species that are desired but are not as frequently used in restoration are spring blooming species and hemiparasites. Spring blooming species are not often found in commercially available seed mixes. So there's kind of this whole component of the diversity. If we think back to the diversity and the diversity in bloom time, there is this whole period that's missing from uh, early blooming species in prairie restorations, such as this prairie smoke. Um, and there is a paper from Natural Areas Journal on the importance of phenological diversity in seed mixes for pollinator restoration, where Kay Havens and Patty Vitt make the argument that these early blooming species are really important for supporting pollinators, but they're absent from restoration seed mixes. So that's kind of a major goal moving forward is to really be able to beef up the diversity of early blooming species and restorations. The other group is hemiparasites. And the idea behind hemiparasites is Hemiparasites, I should say what they are. Hemiparasites are 
partially parasitic plants, so they have green leaves, they're able to do photosynthesis, but they also are parasitic on other plants. So they take nutrients from other plants. And the idea is that these hemiparasites can sort of keep down dominant species and allow other species an opportunity to establish and grow. And because of that, um, the thought is that hemiparasites will promote overall diversity um, in a restoration by kind of keeping down those dominant species. Now, in designing seed mixes, there are a lot of questions that come up, ranging from the type of seed mix, the number of species to plant, the seeding rate, the ratio of forbs to grasses, the seeding method, and more and more. And I'm going to briefly touch on some of these concepts, but there is a lot out there in the literature about seed mixes and prairie restoration and these types of questions. And still, there are a lot of questions that are unanswered for both researchers and restoration land managers on these topics. So I'm going to give you an example of a new paper. Um, this is by Justin Meissen et al., where they studied um, three different types of, of seed mixes and looked at the species establishment. So their mixes were, um, you can kind of see the stats here, but economy mix, an economy mix with 21 species and a three to one grass to four ratio that cost about $321 per hectare or about 130 per acre. A diversity mix with 71 species and a one to one grass to four ratio. And then a pollinator mix with 38 species and a one to three grass to four ratio. So you can kind of see just by looking at these three mixes, the economy mix has more grass in it, grass seed tends to be cheaper, and the pollinator mix has a lot more forbs or wild flowers, which are more expensive, but are of course critical to um, supporting pollinators. And these authors were looking at, so they planted out these three different types of mixes, and they were looking at um, ecosystem multifunctionality. And the way they defined multifunctionality here in this paper was providing, can these mixes provide multiple ecosystem functions simultaneously? And the functions that they looked at in particular were native stem density, native co cover, floral richness, inflorescence production, absence of weeds, absence of bare ground. And for each of these mixes, so they planted them out, they collected data on what was emerging. And for each mix they built, sorry, this is a little bit blurry, um, a flower showing multifunctionality. So you can see the six ecosystem functions around the sides of the flower here. And then the length of the gray line is how that particular mix performed for that particular ecosystem function. So here is the economy mix. You can see that it was high um, ecosystem function in terms of absence of bare ground, native stem density, and native cover, but was low in terms of floral richness and infloresc inflorescence production. And when we think back to the makeup of, those, of that particular mix, it kind of makes sense. Um, that economy mix had a three to one grass to four ratio. So it makes sense that there might be a lot of native cover but less floral richness and inflorescence production. Here is the data for all of those mixes. So economy, which is the one we just looked at, and then the diversity mix in the middle and the pollinator mix at the end. And what you can see, um, and as pollinator people, I don't know if this is surprising or not, but you can see that the pollinator mix actually had the lowest multifunctionality, 54%. And it makes sense because that mix was really targeted towards inflorescence production and floral richness. Um, but that's kind of something to think about when you think about prairie restoration goals in general versus pollinator mix goals. And that some of these things do in a large part to the lack of grasses in the mix um, is that there might be a, like more weeds and more bare ground and um, and lower native species counts because those wildflowers don't 
often take up as much space as um, some of the grasses do. Another paper on that topic that is a really recent paper by German et al. is super abundant C4 grasses are a mixed blessing in restored prairies. This is about grasses again. That is in quotes because it's actually the title of their paper. It's a great title. Um, and what they found in this paper is that reducing cover of abundant tall grasses, and in this case, especially big blue stem, can promote establishment of sown forbs. So if your forbs are not establishing well, it could be due to the fact that some really dominant grasses are preventing the establishment of those forbs. And that's what their model here is showing. It's a little bit complicated, but they have the red arrows are showing negative relationships and the black arrows are showing positive relationships. So you can see that big blue stem abundance is lowering sown forb abundance. Um, Non-sown abundance, so weed abundance, is also lowering forb abundance. So the reason that they call this paper, or they think they're talking about mixed blessings in this paper, is because grasses are important for a lot of things in prairie restorations. They're important for providing structure, providing cover, um, allowing for fires to come through. Um, it's hard to burn a prairie if there isn't a lot of grass in the prairie. Um, so there are a lot of important things about grass in restorations, but another downside of that is that some of those forbs can be suppressed by some of these dominant grasses. And in this paper, they found that it was especially big blue stem. So there are a lot of managers that are not planting very much big blue stem or not planting it at all, assuming that it's going to come in from other sites or just planting it in a very low um amount or later on in the restoration after the forbs have had a chance to kind of establish. Another question that researchers and managers have um, about prairie restoration is what is a good species number and what is a good seeding rate to use? Um, and from our survey, we found a huge range. We found that respondents were seeding between one and 400 species from seed. The average minimum number of species was 37 species. The average maximum number of species was 80 species. And so this is a cool study also in restoration ecology called Optimizing Seed Mixture Diversity and Seeding Rates for Grassland Restoration. Um, by Stephanie Barr et al. And what these authors did was they planted a bunch of different combinations of species diversity and then seeding rate. Um, and after they collected a bunch of biomass to try and figure out what was going on in their plots, and they found that they had the best restoration success with an intermediate amount of species, which is 35 species, and 1,366 species. Um, seeds, pure live seeds per square meter. Uh, they also found, so they found kind of diminishing returns. And this was their question, like, is there a sweet spot somewhere where if you just keep adding more, um, you're not going to get a return on what you're putting in there? And they did find that. And they also found that diversity was more important than the seeding rate in driving restoration success. Um, I think seeding rate is still a, a question that managers are really wondering about and are kind of um, testing, but a rule of thumb that I've heard uh, from a lot of managers is about 10 pounds per acre of seed. So to kind of come back to this figure, um, we talked a lot about seeding and uh, that it makes sense because there is so much variability in terms of seeding. Um, I often like to talk about how if you have a, ser a, a an option of 300 different species and you're going to choose 30 of them, there are 10 to the 41st power different combinations of seed mixes that you can make. And that doesn't take into account differences in weight or anything else that we talked about. So seeding is actually the most variable, designing seed mix is the most variable component of restoration planning for prairies, but there are so many other things that are also very important. 
I'm just going to give a very quick cursory mention of ongoing management, which in prairies consists of fire, um, some measure of uh, control of herbivores, and those spray bottles, which are um, herbicide. And um, that prairie biodiversity is also influenced by the season of burning. So spring burns and fall burns have different effects on the, the composition and the species um, in a prairie. But the managers often burn prairies when they have the chance to, because there are so many things that slow down the burn season. I also wanted to mention the importance of monitoring, and I have a plant and a bee here. Um, and that monitoring uh, restorations can help in an adaptive management framework to go back into, well, are there additional seedings that are necessary? Should there be follow-up seeding? Should there be a change in management based on what was seeded in and what is appearing in the restoration? So that was really just a smattering of some different topics that restoration managers and restoration researchers think about when it comes to establishing diverse and functional prairie restorations. I am happy to take further questions now, or again, if people want to contact me after, I will do my very best to answer any questions that you might have. So thank you for listening. Thank you again for having me to the organizers, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Becky. And with that, we'd like to ask you to turn on your camera and come off mute and invite you all to submit your questions to the Q&A function. Let me just say, I'm sorry about how jumpy that video was. It definitely wasn't when I checked it out after I, I recorded it, so apologies for that. No worries, no worries. Technology always has its way of <laughs> coming in. Um, so the first question, um, can you elaborate a little more on the impacts of spring versus fall burns for tall grass prairies? Oh, I can a little bit. Um, so there are certain functional groups that benefit from um, burns that happen in the different parts of the season. And I, I am not remembering that data off the top of my head, but it has to do with um, certain forbs and their bloom time being preferentially benefited by one or the other of that. And I can look that up. There's papers about that. Um, Marlon Bowles, is a researcher who was at Morton Arboretum and has a few papers on uh, burn timing. But from talking to managers, I get the feeling that um, burning happens when people can. Um, so sometimes the goal is to do a fall burn. And then if that doesn't happen, it becomes a spring burn because that, that, comes, that season kind of comes next and those, those things feed off of one another. Fantastic. Thank you. We will also have in our fifth workshop, we will have uh, a speaker speaking um, yeah, mostly on uh, prescribed fire and the timing of that too. So we invite you to tune in then. Awesome. Uh, we have a couple participants asking about um, the control of uh, goldenrod and techniques to uh, manage overgrowth of goldenrod. Yeah, so there's a few research projects that I know of that are occurring about the control of tall goldenrod, which is a native species, to go back to what Don was talking about. It is native, um, it is a native goldenrod, but it becomes pretty dominant in restoration. And so I know of a study where they are mowing, continually mowing over time, and they are finding that mowing um, is kind of reducing the growth of the tall goldenrod. On the other hand, in those plots at Morton Arboretum, um, the seed plots, we let them be invaded by weeds, just kind of whatever was gonna come. And a lot of the plots ended up with um, tall goldenrod, but we found an asteraceae effect. So goldenrods are asters, they're in the sunflower family. And we found that um, plots that had other dominant asteraceae species, um, so like big sunflowers or New England aster or some other kind of big dominant um, asters actually had less tall goldenrod. So if you can kind of find something else that's in the aster family that kind of grows in that big way, um, 
that can help reduce the amount of tall goldenrod. And I'm trying to think of specific examples that we had, but we had um, bone set, which is an aster. We had um, New England aster. We had a few different symphiotrichums, again, just like Dawn said. <laughs> um, and then we had a, a few sunflowers and a false sunflower. So some of those kind of got big and dominant and they were able to help keep down uh, the tall goldenrod. Excellent, thank you. Um, next question is, what are your thoughts on purchasing locally grown seed versus purchasing outside your state or area? It seems obvious that local seed is better, but wanted to know um, your opinion. Uh, sometimes local seed is not available for purchase. Yeah, so there are a lot of questions about this topic. Um, and I, I don't know if the, my collaborators on this, on this research topic are not here in the audience. They said they might be. Um, but we're actually working on a project on um, climate resilient seed sourcing. And so for the thoughts around climate resilient seed sourcing are that you can get seeds locally um, and a lot of, of kind of landowners, land managers have policies that focus on local seed. But there are ways of collecting seed from slightly further afield to try to increase genetic diversity and also to try and um, increase climate resilience if seeds are sourced from places where the climate is predicted to be more similar. Um, so there are a lot of different ways and um, some models that Patty Vitt has done show that it could depend on the species itself. So for a species that's really kind of common, like has a really large range, is wind pollinated and stuff is moving around all over the place on its own, then it might not be as important to get a hyper-local seed source. Um, but if something has a smaller, very more localized range, is pollinated by insects, um, and it isn't as widespread, then those are cases where looking closer to the restoration site might make more sense. So it's kind of on a species-by-species -species basis. Um, but yeah, a lot of organizations have a lot of different rules, and it's kind of interesting to see how, how those all work. Absolutely. Um, the next question is, do you have any information about the, about success of restoring, of restoration projects that focus on removing non-native vegetation and allowing a native vegetative community to establish itself from seed rather than direct, directly sealing the sites? And it, do you know of anyone that is attempting this for pollinator habitat? So that really depends on what's there, like what is in the seed bank. And for a lot of the areas where restoration happens, they're either in a, a highly agricultural site or in a highly urbanized site, and we just do not expect the native seeds to be there in the seed bank. Um, there are some areas where the disturbance has been rather light, and maybe there wasn't plowing, but there was a little bit of grazing. And in those cases, you can expect that maybe there's a native seed bank. So people say that those prairie seeds can wait underground um, for 50 years until they get the opportunity to emerge. Um, and in those cases, yes, you would want to be pulling out invasive species and, and perhaps um, native species will emerge from the seed bank. And when I say seed bank, I mean the soil seed bank underground, not the like freezer kind of seed bank, because um, we use the same word for both of those and it's not always the best. Um, but in a lot of cases that native seed bank just doesn't exist and there aren't a lot of native plants on site. And so in those cases, you really do have to start from seed or from plug. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, are there soil types that are easier to maintain diversity over time, or does that have to do more with your site prep and seeding diversity? That's a good question. Um, I... Mm, I, my guess is that it's easier to maintain diversity at, in like music prairie soils, um, but I, I don't know. I can't think of data off the top of my head about that. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one last question. Um, I think we'll, we'll wrap up with, uh, what is your position on the effects of continued spring burns and the tra trajectory of, of a site's species composition? Um, that is a good question. So in terms of plant diversity, um, 
persistent burning and consistent burning is good for plants. Um, and we kind of think that uh, pretty much across the board. Um, but in terms of pollinators and other species that live there, I, I don't know, I'm not the right person to ask, I guess. But in, our, in the plant world, um, we're big on burning for sure. Thank you, thank you, and fair enough. Okay, um, and with that, uh, that will conclude our second workshop. Again, I'd like to extend our sincere gratitude to Don Slack, Nate Han, and Becky Barrick for the phenomenal presentations, which were highly informative. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for your, for your participation. Uh, the recording of this workshop will be available and posted in approximately one week. And we'd like to invite you to join our next workshop, Restoration Project Planning, Native Plant Material Selection and Site Preparation, which will take place next Wednesday, November 17th. Thank you all again. Bye-bye.